All right, you'll have to excuse me if I'm a little peripatetic and uh, hyperactive this morning. I forgot to take my equilibrium, so. <laughs> Don't tell Lou Rock all that. My topic is um, the theory of the entrepreneur and profit and loss. And I want to talk, start out by talking about action in daily life. Uh, because before we can really understand the business entrepreneur, or what uh, von Mises called the promoter entrepreneur, we have to understand the entrepreneurial actions, or the, the um, entrepreneurial aspects of everyday action. So uh, let me give you a, a statement that, that von Mises makes uh, about action and uncertainty in human action. Okay, I'm quoting. He says, all action is embedded in the flux of time and involves speculation. In other words, all action involves uncertainty. Okay. What we're trying to do at any given point in time is to increase what we, uh, um, or improve the circumstances that we forecast in the future, okay, um, to come about without our intervention in the state of affairs compared to what it would be if we acted in a certain way. So keep, keep in mind now that all, all human actions take time and they're aimed at incre increasing our satisfaction at, at some point in the future. Uh, once we, we, we um, note that, we point out then that the costs of action, which I'll talk about, and the benefits of action are uncertain. Okay? We don't know exactly how our actions will turn out. Though we can make educated guesses, informed guesses. Uh, and to just to give you an example, um, just attending the Mises University this week, uh, there were foregone alternatives, like foregone opportunities for satisfaction that you may have faced. Uh, you may have been able to go on a camping trip with, with friends for the week, or you may have been uh, able to work a, an, a, an extra week and earn $400. So these are all, the, these are some of the costs of attending the Mises University. The benefits are what you expected um, the improvement in your welfare to be. Now if that improvement, that benefit, exceeds the, 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 the cost, the highest alternative of what you've given up, then you've gained what Mises calls a psychic profit. So profit is an aspect of all action, not just business action. We define psychic profit as a difference between benefits and costs of action. Now, you can, up to this point, have been very bored or put off by the um, university. Okay, that's strictly hypothetical. Because I know no one here is bored or put off, and they're, they're all very enthusiastic about the whole thing. But let's say that hypothetical person regrets having come here. Okay, now that regret means that in the context of, 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 of what they've given up, they made a mistake. That is, that this doesn't always have to be positive. This can be less than the cost. Meaning that when that occurs, there's a psychic loss. Okay. So regretting an action that you undertake involves or implies that, that there's been a loss. Okay. No one knowingly would give up something that is more valuable than, than, than what they're getting in an action. Okay. So we have psychic profit, psychic loss. We have two other notions that are very important. Ex ante, from before the action, ex post. Ex ante, benefits are always greater than costs. Okay? That is because you're, you're rational in the sense that you're purposeful. You always choose what you expect to, to be the most valuable alterna alternative use of your resources. But ex post, depending on how good an entrepreneur you are, either of these alternatives could occur. You could find out that, in fact, you regret having come to the Mises University. Or, you could be very happy with the choice. In the latter case, you earn an ex post profit. In the former case, um, a loss. Okay. Now, that ex post position is, determines whether or not you're a good entrepreneur. Now, Mises points out that from the time that you gain consciousness as a human being, okay, you know, two or three year old, and you begin consciously to aim at certain ends, at that point you're beginning to exercise entrepreneurship. So everyone in their daily lives 
is an entrepreneur to a greater or lesser extent. Well, everyone is an entrepreneur. Okay, everyone, all actions are speculative. And there's a, 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 what we call a datum of human action, and that is, if you look around in the world, there's a variety of ability among different people to forecast the future outcome of, the, of, of his or her actions and to adjust their actions to that future. Okay? So that's what, what entrepreneurship implies, forecasting the future and adjusting one's actions so that they maximize the satisfaction. And just to give you um, a quick example, let's say that um, upon your graduation from college, let's say a, a rich aunt gives you $1,000. Okay? And you have a number of alternative uses of that $1,000. And let's assume that one use might be to go on a cruise to Bermuda. Okay. But you also might want to buy a new PC, okay, which also would, would absorb, let's say, $1,000. Or you could spend the next year just partying okay, with $1,000. Or you could put in a zero coupon bond. Okay, as part of a down payment for a new car that you intend to buy in a, in a, in a few years. So let's assume you choose this. Okay. Well, if you rank this first, this second, and so on, this third, then the benefit is, is, is the expected satisfaction from the cruise to Bermuda. The cost is what you expect, the, the, the flow of satisfaction that you expect from the, using the personal computer system. Okay. And you could very well be wrong. But we, what I want to do, do make clear again is that some people system, systematically <coughs> misforecast the future. Okay, we know people that continually make wrong choices. They choose a major in college and they get out, there's absolutely no job in that major. Okay? Um, or they, they buy a motorcycle and they realize that after having ridden it in the rain a number of times and having some close calls with trucks and so on, that they hate the motorcycle. Okay. So entrepreneurship is an aspect of, of everyday life. People are better or worse entrepreneurs. Those people who are better tend to be the people that make better choices in life. Okay, choices that they are much less likely to regret later on. Okay. But that's not the type of entrepreneur I want to focus on today. Okay, that's the background for entrepreneurship. Okay, I want to focus on what Ludwig von Mises calls the promoter entrepreneur. And Mises thought it was important to make a distinction <coughs> between this type of entrepreneurship and not only the everyday type of entrepreneurship, but also a laborer entrepreneur. Okay? You're a laborer entrepreneur to the extent that you make a choice about a college major. Okay? You're making a choice about your future earnings. If you go into finance or accounting and come out four years later and find out that the relative salaries are much lower than you expected and that you should have gone into education, okay, and become a teacher, well then, as a labor entrepreneur, you, you suffered a loss, a, a, a relative loss in your wages. Okay? Same thing is true with a landowner entrepreneur, um, but it's the promoter entrepreneur that really determines the, um, or is the motive force of the market economy. Okay? The promoter entrepreneur is the individual who ultimately determines how to organize the factors of production. Okay, that's how we would define the, uh, the, the <coughs> promoter entrepreneur. And it is, it's, it's a class of real people, a class of, of those people who, who want to profit from adjusting production to a changing future. In other words, they voluntarily assume the burden of uncertainty, okay? Because they believe that they can profit from adjusting to that uncertainty. Many of us attempt to minimize uh, the uncertainty that we face, okay? But the promoter entrepreneurs are those people that stand out from the crowd, that are much better at forecasting what future conditions will be, and are much better at arranging the factors, the resources, in a way that will profit 
from those forecasts. Okay, and, and, and I think if you go look back over your um, your academic and scholastic careers in, in school and and college, there there are always people who uh, run run, for example, uh, when I when I went to college, run like a football pool, okay, or or, or some other sort of a betting pool and, and and profit, okay, or they're the ones that that will buy um, well in the old days. Uh, they would buy beer and, and sneak it into the dorm and sell it at twice the price they got it for. Okay, but there, there are always people that, that are like that. Okay, and those people are, are already, be, you know, becoming a burgeoning promoter entrepreneurs. Okay. Uh, all right. Now, wh what's the specific function of the entrepreneur? As 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 I pointed out, the specific function is to determine the use or employment of the factors of production. Now, that's a very general statement. What does that actually mean? Okay. It actually means that the, the promoter entrepreneur, and I'll just use now the word entrepreneur for short, the entrepreneur determines what to produce, how to produce, that is what technology to use, where to produce, okay, and what quantities and qualities of the good to produce. So, in sum, the entrepreneur is the ultimate decision make, maker in the business world. He or she decides how to use labor, capital, and land. He or she formulates the plans for using these factors and produ to produce some future output. Now, given that they're the ultimate decision maker, they also have a very important function to perform. And that is, they're the ones that have to forecast the uncertain future, forecast what consumer demands will be, not just today, but six months from now, five years from now, seven years from now. Uh, if you take the example of, of IBM in the early 1980s, IBM had the um, late 70s, early 80s, IBM had the technology, had developed the technology for the PC. But the CEO of, of um, IBM at the time, I think it was Tom Watson was his name, is quoted as saying something like, PCs will never be more than a, a, a household toy. Okay. So what he did was to continue to make investment decisions that led to the production of, of mainframes throughout the 80s and, and early 90s. At the same time, there was someone who, who um, was in, in his garage, Stephen, Stephen Jobs, or Jobs, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, the, the, the person who was the a mastermind behind Apple, who saw the commercial possibility of that technology, okay, of, of the small computer technology, and believed that there would be a business demand in the later 80s for, for these small computers, okay, and went ahead and formed Apple. So he made some ultimate decisions. He's very, very small. Now, what happened by 1990-91, actually 92-93, in those two years, the profits of IBM was negative thirteen billion dollars. IBM had lost five billion in ninety two, eight billion in ninety three. Okay. On the other hand, Apple was was thriving the late eighties, early nineties. Because of superior entrepreneurship. The same thing is true of, of the US auto companies. When we had the gasoline crises of the nineteen seventies, first in seventy three, when we had gasoline lines, then in nineteen seventy nine American automakers, even though the price of gasoline had risen from something like 30 cents a gallon to $1.30 a gallon by the end of, of, of the decade of the 1970s, American automakers, Chrysler, GM, Ford, continued to, to build huge, comfortable, but gas-guzzling automobiles. Right? And in 1980, 1981, um, GM uh, uh, lost something like, or I guess it was all three together, lost $5 billion. Um, Chrysler almost went out of business and was bailed out by the federal government. Okay. Now, why was that? That was because the Japanese automakers at that time, um, who had experienced high prices of gasoline in Japan, um, bet that American consumers would give up large, their, their, their large, comfortable, um, gas-inefficient automobiles if the cost of gasoline rose high enough. And they believed, moreover, that the cost of gasoline was going to stay high through the 80s. And they were correct in that judgment. 
But that entrepreneurship was, exercise, was, was focused on five, ten years down the road. That is making huge investments in marketing ja smaller compact and subcompact Japanese cars in the United States. So they faced huge investments, and they were correct on those investments. Whereas the U.S. oil companies, instead of retooling and, and downsizing their automobiles, continued to produce large automobiles. Okay? Now, eventually, they, they, they realized that this would lead to, to continuing profits, continuing red ink, and that they would have gone out of business. Okay? So past success, the U.S. The US auto companies were extremely successful in the 50s and 60s. IBM was extremely successful, in fact, was synonymous with the word computers in the 60s. Yet past success does not guarantee future success. Entrepreneurship involves continuous adjustment of production to changing conditions. Continuous, the uh, economist William H. Hutt, who was a, a pretty good Austrian, said that entrepreneurship involves perpetual forecasting. Okay. You can't think you have a great product once and for all and determine that you're never going to change that product like IBM did. IBM continued to believe that one, mainframe computers would be used by business, and two, that computers would never be standardized, that they would never become commodities like apples. Apples the fruit, okay, <laughs> or wheat, okay. They continued to believe that all computers would always need sort of a customized touch that their salespeople would always work closely with their customers and would, they would always give the customers what they wanted. Okay. And they were wrong. There was a guy, Bill Gates, who believed that software would become standardized and that PCs would eventually become all pretty much the same in, in, in their inner workings. And so that Bill Gates bet on that and, and became a multi-billionaire. Okay. Again, Bill Gates... Um, I don't think he finished college, right? Uh, he also worked in the mailroom, um, was it at IBM or wherever it was, for, uh, for, for a period of time. In other words, we, we, can't, we can never train entrepreneurs. We don't, we, it's very difficult to determine even where they come from. What, uh, there's been some, some psychological studies on entrepreneurs, but basically the entrepreneur is, is, is undetermined. We don't know why some people are not just better than other people forecasting the future, but much better than other people at forecasting the future. Okay. So, in addition to being the ultimate decision maker, or, or as an implication of being the ultimate decision maker, the entrepreneur must also be a forecaster and appraiser of future prices. Appraiser meaning they have to figure out relatively accurately what the prices of a good will be, not just a year from now, but maybe five or ten years from now. Okay, depending on, on the type of investment. Now, one other point to uh, keep in mind, the entrepreneur must also own capital, must be a capital owner. So, um, Professor Israel Kirzner, uh, an Austrian economist who wrote a, a, a pretty good book on competition and entrepreneurship, doesn't believe that. Professor Kirzner believes you just need a very, very good idea. Okay? You can be pure and penniless. You can be a pure and penniless entrepreneur. But as someone pointed out, once a pure and penniless entrepreneur, always a pure and penniless entrepreneur. You have to have some capital. You have to put some capital at risk. Okay. Now, it's true that there are venture capitalists out there that are willing to back good ideas. But there still must be some, 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 some resources that the, the, the real flesh and blood entrepreneur owns okay, and puts at risk. And to the extent, I mean, if there is an idea that somebody has and has absolutely no money, then it's the venture capitalist backing that person that becomes the, the real capitalist entrepreneur. Okay? It's not just ideas themselves that result in new products. Okay? There has to be entrepreneurship. For example, I don't know if you know, but the person who um, invented the Superman character in the 1930s was not the person who profited from, from all the Superman comic books and, and, and movies later on, so the television show. Okay, that person didn't foresee the tremendous popularity of the character and sold the uh, rights to that character in the mid-1930s, the middle of the Depression, for $500. Okay. So he, he was not the entrepreneur. 
the entrepreneur was, I don't know who, who purchased the rights of the character, that, he was the entrepreneur, okay? So entrepreneurship doesn't mean innovation necessarily. It means more, much more than innovation. Okay. You have to market an innovation or a new invention. You have to market it properly. Uh, now, having said all that, you realize that the individual that bears the sole risk in production is the entrepreneur. Okay? Think about it. The people who worked as engineers as programmers and so on for IBM, did they lose any of that $13 billion in those two years in 1992 and 1993 when IBM lost $13 billion? Did they get paid every two weeks or every month? Yes, they got paid in advance. of the. Remember, all production takes time. You have to pay the factors of production in advance. You are bidding against other entrepreneurs who want to use them for, for other products. So you must bid them away and pay them in advance which means that the entrepreneur is sometimes, in textbook you'll see, the residual claimant. In other words, he gets the residue. What's left over after all money costs have been paid, you subtract those money costs from the um, revenues that, that you derive from selling the product, and what's left over is owned by the entrepreneur. But the same thing, what the textbooks will tell you this, but what they don't tell you, what they don't stress as much, is that he's a sole bearer of risk in production. It doesn't mean that, that, that the engineers and so on might not, uh, it does not mean that they, they do not suffer from bad decisions. They can, they can get laid off and so on. But during the period when the, uh, incorrect entrepreneurial decisions are being carried out, those people get paid the full value of their contribution. Because if they didn't, what would they do? They would leave and go to other companies. Okay. So they don't suffer any loss from incorrect entrepreneurial decisions. Okay. Now let's attempt to distinguish between the uh, promoter or the entrepreneur and the manager. Because here's where neoclassical textbooks, your micro textbooks, confuse matters. The firm is, is, is originated and, and ultimately controlled by the entrepreneur. But now remember, the, the entrepreneur has, this, has a, a plan for production. And he carries out this plan with capital by investing in the factors of production and determining how they're going to be used. But obviously, someone like Bill Gates cannot be everywhere at once. So he hires subordinate uh, so, so people that are directly subordinate to him to oversee the implementation of his production plan. Okay. Now, they are really part of his duties. He are, in other words, managers do carry out entrepreneurial duties. Okay things that he would carry out if he, if he could be omnipresent, if he could know everything. They make decisions that can cause losses or, or, or profits for the company. Okay. He has to have someone to make sure that costs are being kept down, that, 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 that you're, you're in a particular department, you're always trying to buy a particular good or supply of a good at the lowest price. You have to have someone doing that. Okay. You can't be everywhere at once. Okay. Also, things are continually changing. Even though they might not be changing that radically, they're continually changing. So all parts of the firm have to, have to adapt to that, those changes within the context of the entrepreneurial plan. And this is the, the job of the managers. Now, managers can get bonuses if their departments are in profits. Okay? And if, they're, if, they're, if their departments continually uh, do poorly, they can get fired. But what makes them not entrepreneurs, okay, what, what bars them from being entrepreneurs is that, do they ever earn a, zero, a, a, a negative income? Managers never earn a negative income. In other words, they do not bear the risk of loss of bad decisions. All right? They still get paid their managerial wages, even if they make the worst possible decisions. They'll eventually get fired, but they don't lose from those particular decisions. 
Okay? So they do not risk any capital in production. That's why they are not entrepreneurs. Okay, there's a very fine line here, but, 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 but von Mises calls them junior partners of the entrepreneur. They certainly um, share in entrepreneurial profit, okay, if they make correct decisions, through, especially through bonuses and, and so on, or raises, but they, they, they do not um, bear any risk of loss. Well, beginning in the 1930s, there was a controversy that arose, okay, about who controls the corporate firm. And on one side, there were people who claimed that because corporations were so large and because now you had many, many stockholders, Ownership and control was split. There was an ownership control uh, split or dichotomy. Okay, the owners, who were all stockholders scattered throughout the country, did not exercise control over the firm. Therefore, the firm was not run in the interests of maximizing the profits of the owners or the entrepreneurs. It was run for the benefit of managers. Okay. That is the, uh, now later on, in the 1960s, John Kenneth Galbraith claimed it was run in, uh, for, for the benefit of the uh, t technological and the managerial elites. Uh, the tech, he called it the technocracy, or the, um, the technocracy? I think he called it the technocracy. Okay. Well, let's, let's look at that for a moment. First of all, let me just tell you a little story that Murray Rothbard used to tell. Um, Let's, let's say that, um, you're, um, that, that one of the Rockefellers owns a, a huge estate in upstate New York and goes there only on the weekends and hires a head gardener. Now, if you're observing the estate, the head gardener is completely in charge of all the landscaping on the estate, making the decision every day, making all, all decisions. Okay? Um, Rockefeller's away. You know, rarely comes there. When he does come there, he, you just see him go in and out. He doesn't, he doesn't make any decisions about, about what, what the, the, the tremendous amount of landscaping, uh, and he makes no decisions about it, what it should look like. Would you say that, that Rockefeller doesn't really um, own this estate or, or the land on which it, on, on which it sits? Uh, that, that, that the head gardener is, is, is running for his own benefit? No, because Rockefeller could walk out of the, ha of the house one day and look around and say, I don't like this. This is terrible. This is crappy. You're fired, okay? So one response is, first of all, um, the board of directors can always fire the managers, okay? The board of directors representing stockholders' interests, number one, okay? And can put in a new team of managers, okay? Number two, there are generally, in most firms, a few large stockholders that have some influence or that have a lot of influence. They don't have to own more than 50%. They can own 10% or 20 but they're large enough that they can arrange a proxy fight meaning they can get the votes of other stockholders. They can convince other stockholders that if you throw out the board of directors, they can appoint a better uh, board of directors that will increase profits. Okay. And thirdly, and most importantly, of course, and this was a phenomenon that we saw in the, in the late 1980s, firms can be taken over. There can be hostile takeovers. There is a market for corporate control. In other words, even small stockholders have an influence on who manages the firm and how they manage the firm. Okay. Because what do small stockholders do if they're really dissatisfied with the performance of the firm? Yeah, they can sell stock. And if you sell stock, what happens to the value of the firm? It falls. So if there's a firm whose total outstanding stock is, let's say, $100 billion, And there is a, a, another entrepreneur out there who owns another firm who believes that, boy, you know, I can, I can buy this firm up for $100 billion or $110 billion, and I think that potentially I can increase the profitability of the firm so that the stock shares increase, the 50, uh, increase by $50 billion. Okay? What will that entrepreneur do? That entrepreneur will go out and begin to, 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 to a hostile takeover of the firm. And then throw the managers out, front managers out, put his own management team in. 
And in the process, let's say, let's say he, he, he pays $110 billion, $120 billion for all the outstanding stock. In the process, they're earning $30 billion profit. Okay. Now, managers know this. So even though they would like to have higher only, let's say, uh, pretty secretaries rather than efficient secretaries, they would like to have a helicopter on standby for all their needs. They would like to have a fleet of, of limousines to take their children to school. They would like to have um, very expensive art hanging in their offices. Okay, now, managers would do that. I mean, if, if they get away with it, there's no doubt about it. It's in their interest to do that. But they can't get away with it because that always raises costs. Managers want to raise costs. And when you raise costs, they want to increase their own salaries. They want to increase the size of their staff. They want to hire people that they like rather than necessarily efficient people. All of that raises costs. And that decreases the profits of the stockholders. But that's reflected in share prices. Stockholders will start to sell their shares. That will drive the share prices lower. And it will make the firm a target for a hostile takeover. And what was interesting, in the 19, late 1980s, you had um, uh, a big debate over whether or not the Japanese model was, uh, of, of corporate control was better, where uh, the um, stockholders weren't that powerful, where managers were then able and free to plan for the future. Okay, we were just, you know, supposedly American uh, uh, managers were, were very short-sighted because they had to maximize the um, stock prices. But of course, stock prices are determined how? Basically, they reflect the expected flow of profits discounted into the future. Okay, so first of all, maximizing stock prices is maximizing the long-run value of the firm. Okay. But, and, and, and secondly, what was very interesting was, if you look at the letters in the Wall Street Journal and New York Times during this period, you had many people writing in saying, yes, yes, um, uh, the Japanese model is better. Uh, we are forced to be too short-sighted. Now, now, guess who, who many of those people were, people were that were writing in? The managers of firms that were doing poorly and that were targets for, for hostile takeovers. Okay? So even though there is what's called an agency problem, that the agent's interests don't necessarily coincide, the agent being the managers, don't necessarily coincide with the principles, the principal being the owner, stockholder. Um, the market provides mechanisms for monitoring the agent, okay, very effective mechanisms. Also making the, um, the stock of the, the, the manager a part owner by, by, by paying them in stock options. Then they're interested to what? Maximize stock price. And there are many other uh, ways of, of doing this. Okay, now let me talk a little bit about entrepreneurial profit and loss and what it actually is and what, it, and what, it, what, what the social implications are of, of, of maximizing profit. And let me just give you a very simple example. Let's assume that someone, well actually before I do that, let me give you the, the, the basic definition of, of profit. In economics, we use the Greek letter pi to represent profit because we usually use p to represent price. Um, profit is, is always equal to total revenue, the, 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 the price that you charge for the product times the number of units that you sell at that price, okay, minus the total cost, that is the total um, prices that you pay for the labor, land, and capital inputs in that production process. However, there's a, a difference in the way that economists account for total costs and accountants account for total cost. The best way to show this difference is through a simple example. Let's assume there is someone who um, runs a small landscaping company and has total money costs of $100,000. This is the amount of money he, um, he spends on, on the labor, on the fertilizer, on the shrubbery, on the tools, and, uh, and, and so on that's used in the business. And let's say that total revenue from his landscaping uh, customers is $120,000. And let's forget for the moment about depreciation. Um, well, the accountant would say that there is net earnings or profit of, of $20,000. But, but the economist would want to know more. Because remember, the, the, the economist wants to make sure that we account for all valuable re scarce resources that are used in the production process. Well, let's say the, account, uh, the, the economist um, knows that this manager 
or this owner also manages the business. Okay, is the everyday manager goes on on on, on the site with, with with the laborers and so on. Well, you have to account for the managerial labor. Okay, now how do we how do we determine what, what managerial labor is worth? That is, if the owner provides the labor. Yeah, what's the next best use of, 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 of that labor resource that the owner has? Well, the owner could go to work, let's say, for another small company as a manager and earn $30,000. So we have to include the foregone wages. In other words, these are all called implicit. We have to know all the implicit costs. There's the resources that are owned by the owner of the firm and are used in the firm, but, but, but are not paid for. The owner doesn't actually literally pay himself $30,000. So we have foregone wages for $30,000. And there's also a truck that he may use, um, that he owns. Okay, a dump truck that he uses in the business. Okay. How do we account for the value of that truck? Well, that truck could be leased out for the year. Let's say it could be leased out for $5,000. Well, there's a foregone rent. So he doesn't have to actually pay $5,000. It's not reflected in his money costs, okay. But also, let's assume that he started this business with the hundred thousand dollar investment in the factors of production with his own savings that he didn't go to a bank and borrow it. So he's not making any interest payments. So interest doesn't appear here. But yet there is foregone interest. He could have put it, let's say, in a pretty riskless CD. And let's and let's assume this is back in the '80s and that he could have earned. 10% on the CD instead of what the quarter percent we're getting now. Um, and, and so t he foregoes $10,000. Now, we have $45,000 of implicit costs. So the, the total cost, the total cost of this operation is $145,000. So in this particular case, The owner has lost $25,000. It's an entrepreneurial loss of $25,000. Now think of it in this way. If he never started this business, if he went to work for someone else and leased his truck out and left his money in the certificate of deposit, at the end of the, of, of the year, what would he have? He'd have his $100,000 in principal and he'd have the $45,000 of income from the resources he owns. So in order for, to say that this person has earned an entrepreneurial profit, he has to at least earn back the $145,000. Okay. Anything beyond that is a pure profit. Okay. So pure profit occurs when total revenue is greater than total cost. When the value of the product is greater than the value of all resources used in, in creating the product. Well, actually, I don't want to use the word create because we don't create a product. Okay. But in, in, in producing the product. So having said that, what's the source, the source and the social function of, of profit? Okay. Well, the source is what? It's the continual change, the continual change in people's demands and technology and so on. Okay. So it's uncertainty and change that's really the source. Right. Um, let me give you the following example. If we lived in a world in which everyone knew exactly what prices <coughs> Of, of, of all consumers' goods would exist at every date in the future, okay, what would people rush to do? If everybody knew the prices that, 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 that a computer five years from now, a PC would be, would, would be $400, and that uh, a certain model of, of, of type of, of, of automobile would be $40,000. Well, what would you, what would you, what would you um, offer me if I, um, well, I don't, I, don't, I have it here, if I held up this ten dollar bill, okay. Let's say I, I I auctioned this off. You know there's a ten dollar bill up here, okay. How much would you pay for this? How much would you bid for it? After the bidding process in this in this, in this room was done, how much do I get for the ten dollar bill? No. Approximately ten dollars, maybe slightly less, which would rep the discount would represent the, the the cost of of getting up and actually coming up here and and, 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 and taking it from me, okay. Now let's assume there's no uncertainty involved here. Okay, uh, that 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 uh, you forget that I'm um, my my name ends in a vowel and I'm, and I'm from New Jersey, and so you trust that I'm actually going to hand this over to you. So um, it would be so you're perfectly certain that there's ten dollars here, right? So so in other words, 
if everyone knew, if, if there were prices of these goods out there that everyone knew for certain, they would bid up the prices of resources so that the, price, the, the cost would be always equal to what? Total revenue. Now, minus would be slightly less because the, the income that you, you're expecting from producing with these resources are, is always in the future. So if it was a year away, there would have to be a little bit of a difference for an interest return, okay, <laughs> due to people's time preferences. Okay? But there would be no pure profit. There would be an interest return. Everyone would earn some, some rate of interest. But there would be no pure profit because everybody knows what future the future holds. Okay? So the source of, of profits is uncertainty. Okay? If you, we stopped, if we froze all change right now, okay, if technology never changed again, if people's tastes never changed again, eventually all prices, uh, all profits and losses would disappear and there would never be any profits and losses again. Okay? Eventually production would be adjusted. So you see, so the, the, the problem that the entrepreneur faces is, is not is not to produce the same thing over and over again, but to continuously change production to adjust it to changing demands, technology, and so on. Uh, let me give you some examples of this. Um, well, well that, that's the, uh, the source. Now, the, the social function, it's true that obviously if there's a profit, the entrepreneur himself or herself benefits, but what about society? Let's take the case of a, of a famous movie of a few years ago, um, The Blair Witch Project. Okay, now The Blair Witch Project took around $60,000 to produce. Now, there was a lot of uh, later costs by, by the, the company that bought it and distributed it, uh, advertising costs and marketing costs. But the, for, for, for the entrepreneurs that, 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 that made the film, it was $60,000. The film the last time I looked, had grossed around $50 million okay, worldwide. Okay. So it's a big difference between total cost and total revenue. Okay. Even if we include all the implicit costs in this, okay, maybe it brings up 120000 whatever. Okay. Mass, now, obviously that benefited the people who made the film, okay. but what about society as a whole? Was society benefited? From the point of consumer, in other words, was there an improvement in consumer welfare? Yes, because these resources would have been used, the reason why they were, were $60,000, they would have been used to produce other goods and services that were worth about what? $60,000, because that's what other entrepreneurs were willing to pay for them. You as an entrepreneur only have to pay as much as someone else is bidding for them. But what is that other person's bid based on? the value that they foresee of those resources in producing goods and services. So what, what, what profit, the social function of profit is to motivate and bring about a movement of resources from lower valued uses to higher valued uses. Okay? When, when ca another example, Cabbage Patch Dolls came out, they were $75. And they were flying off the, the stores that Christmas, I, I remember. And, and I mean, they even had things on television where women were fighting with each other. To, to grab the cabbage patch dolls, and their costs were around thirty dollars. Okay. Once again, remember the cabbage patch doll was different from other dolls because each one was they were all ugly, but they were, each one was individually ugly. Uh, each one had their own birth certificate, their own name. Uh, where, where they weren't standard dolls. This is a new idea. Okay. So using basic plastic and, and other types of resources that were freely available, the producers paid the thirty dollars per unit cost, and they sold them for $75. Again, they benefited consumers, because otherwise they would have gone into producing goods and services that were worth only $30 to consumers. Um, one of my favorite examples is um, the, the example of, well, uh, I think the females would know or would remember, may remember this. It was called the, um, what the heck was the name of it? Oh, the Topsy Tale. I wonder what that was. It made making um, uh, ponytails much easier. Okay, very simple device. And I, I, let me just tell you the story because I think it's a great story that that really um, uh, demonstrates or illustrates entrepreneurship. There was a woman. Her name was Tomima Edmark, and she uh, she worked for IBM. She was a mainframe saleswoman. Good thing she got out of that. Um, but one day she thought she thought that her blonde ponytail looked a little drab. So. Um, 
but she found that she could braid her ponytail by using a makeshift device that consisted of a plastic loop and a, and a knitting needle. Okay. Um, she so she decided to patent it. So she spent five invested five thousand dollars in patenting it. Okay. Um, she then went, went around to see if people if, if there was anyone who could produce this this product and. Um, she she found uh, that she could pay n another nine thousand dollars for uh, in in, sa in the savings that she had for a mold, a mold and uh, she found a plastic maker who would produce as many topsy tails as she needed for about fifty cents a piece. Okay. So her, her costs were fifty cents. Okay. Well, plus whatever the fixed cost was of the initial investment of, of fourteen thousand dollars for the patent and the uh, and the and the um, the mold. Uh, in any case, uh, she then bought an ad um, uh, in, in a, a hairstyle magazine, cheap, a very cheap ad, and her first orders that came in were, a thousand, uh, for, were worth $1,000. Um, by the end of 1991, she was moving 200 units a month, and she was selling them for $10 each. Okay. Okay. Um, then she was, in, she was in New York on IBM Business, and she pervade, persuaded a Glamour magazine uh, editor um, to try the Topsy Tail. Okay, within three weeks, uh, well, they featured it in their February '92 issue. Within three weeks, um, she had a hundred thousand dollars worth of orders, and had to get her cleaning lady to help her stuff four hundred envelopes each week. Okay, then IBM fired her. They laid her off. Okay, they were going through hard times, and that was her best break ever. Um, <laughs> Because they gave her an early retirement package, and she used it uh, twenty-five thousand um, dollars to go to retailers and, and and hawk her product to hair salons and so on. Um, but of course, she still wasn't making big sales. But she finally got someone, uh, a small TV company, um, TV production company, uh, that that promotes things like kitchen gadgets and sunglasses. Um, they they had a two-minute. They made a two-minute commercial for her, and they managed to top her, her television marketing and uh, her print advertising and retail distribution. Okay, she, she went on TV herself in this commercial, and um, she uh, made the pitch, and then you know the, the commercial ran, and she was then then sold in 20 months. 250,000 Topsy Tails at $10 a piece, okay? And uh, in the first six months after uh, her commercial hit the networks, uh, the pro she sold, oh, I see what happened. Okay, this, this was before she had the commercials. She had sold about 250,000 at $10 a piece. Okay, then the commercial hit in December 92. She sold 3.6 million at $15 a piece. In the meantime, her costs were falling to 30 cents. Okay, well, you... Um, uh, 22 cents, excuse me. Okay. 22 cents. All right, so you, you get the idea. Uh, did she benefit, did consumers benefit from this? Sure, because the plastic and the needles that, that, that could have been used elsewhere for products worth 22 cents was being used in a new and different way for a product that was worth to consumers $15. Okay. Now, once the people begin earning profits, the, the, the proofs of these entrepreneurs who produce these various products, um, do they earn those profits forever? No, because other entrepreneurs come in and begin to produce goods that are very, very like the goods that are being produced. Now, that does two things. It increases the supply, so it pushes the price down. And on the other hand, they begin bidding for some of the same resources, realizing these resources are really more valuable, pushing the prices or costs up. So um, in, the, in the year after the, uh, the Cabbage Patch craze, Cabbage Patch dolls were selling for $50 and less, and there were others imitators of Cabbage Patch dolls. Okay? And uh, she, uh, even though she patented this, there were many others that began to copy the, the Topsy tail, and, and then I'm sure it doesn't cost $15 anymore. Okay? Um, so we might say then that, uh, that profits are a signal about what resources are really worth, and they're an incentive for entrepreneurs to move into that area where there's a maladjustment and begin to increase output of the product. And when that happens, eventually, over time, what has to happen to the profit? As long as there's free entry, what has to happen to the profit in the, in the area of any product? 
has to fall to zero. It has to fall to zero. Because as long as there's any difference between total cost and total revenue, that is an incentive for more people to come in, increase supply, which drives price down, bid for the undervalued resources, which drive their prices up, and, and get rid of the, of the, um, the, the profit differential. Th does that mean that people that make Cabbage Patch dolls or people that sell bread, where, where, where you know, the basic standard white bread, don't earn, don't earn any return on their investment? No, they earn a normal interest return, okay? which reflects their time preference and, and, and the basic risk of the business itself. Okay? But they don't earn any pure, uh, pure profit. Okay. Uh, another po a point I want to make is that um, <laughs> even though profits tend to disappear, they always reappear again. Okay? Well, why, why haven't all profits long since disappeared as production has been adjusted? Well, I gave the answer before. It's because of continual change. Okay? Um, for a while in the beer market, light beers were all the rage. And Miller Lite, when they first introduced light beer back in the 1970s, was selling light beer for a high price. But pretty quickly we got, um, uh, we, we got Michelob Light and we got Coors Light later on and, and, and the light beer market adjusted. Okay. And for a while we, we didn't really see any, any profits being earned in the beer market until a couple of years ago when what happened they introduced flavored malted beverage, beverages. And the first was Mike's Hard Lemonade. Okay, we hit the shelves two, two summers ago. And um, they were selling for $7 a six pack, $8 a six pack. Now you can find all these flavored malt beverages by many, many different companies. Okay, McCarty's, uh, Silver Ice, and all of these different types of of, 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 of beers, okay, or, or malted liquors. And the market has, pr and, and prices have come down, the market has adjusted. But there's continual change in, in taste, there's continual um, responses of entrepreneurs to the original entrepreneur's um, product uh, to, in, in, the term, in terms of com competing with it, and that wipes out profits, okay. Even though the, the source of profits never go away, the change never goes away, okay. Uh, now, what in a situation in which you have uh, profits initially being um, bid away, there's still a way to earn profits. Okay? That's by technological improvement. Okay? So, for example, when hand calculators first came out, they were $350, okay, Texas Instruments. And let's assume that, I don't know what the cost was, let's assume the cost was $200. And pretty quickly you had other people bring out electronic hand calculators and so that price dropped to what cost or cost came up a little bit, so the 220. Okay, so this was the average cost, this is the price. There was no profit. But what happened was, because of the microchip revolution, companies that were making hand calculators realized that this new technology allowed them to add more functions, to downsize it, to lower the cost of producing it. So over time, through the 70s and early 80s, the prices fell. Okay, so the first company that was able to imp implement the new, new um, the new technology may have driven its cost down to $100 and still sold it, it cut their price maybe to 200 to undersell the competitors. So they earned a hundred dollar huge hundred dollar profit. So what did the competitors do? They immediately implemented the new technology or even a better technology. Now today we have hand calculators that are more sophisticated than the original $350 hand calculator. Their average cost is $5, but so is their price $5. So not only does profits promote the introduction of new, of, of new products that will better serve consumer demands, it also promotes the, 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 the continual lowering of price and, of, of, of older products. And um, one, uh, one, one interesting example that I have here is the introduction of the ballpoint pen. Um, up in, really up until mid 1940s, everyone used those nib pens. You had to put the ink in, and it always got all over the place. It was sloppy, it smeared. But it was um, the Reynolds International Pen Company that decided that you could use a, um, a ball bearing, okay, in, in, in a pen, and that it would be um, commercially feasible. So they marketed it, and uh, the first ballpoint pens uh, came out and were sold uh, at Gimbel's in New York, an old New York company, at the twelve dollars and fifty cents. Okay, now that's back in 1945 dollars. That's 
um, let's say the price level has gone up around 10 times since then, and it's $125, okay? Um, so pens were extremely costly. They were, they were, uh, ballpoint pens were, were more or less a conspicuous consumption item where you would, you know, instead of leaving a BMW in your driveway, you would leave a ballpoint pen out on your coffee table if you had a party or something. So, so people saw how well off you were. In any case, almost immediately, um, by the way, they were selling them for 12.50, the cost was 80 cents. So they're earning huge profits, which meant that other, that lured others in. Um, and Macy's then introduced, Macy's was Gimbel's big competitor in New York, introduced an imported ballpoint pen and sold it for $19.98. Then a new American company started, Eversharp. This is in, in, April, in April of 1946, about six months after the first pen was introduced. Eversharp began selling at $15. Then another company, another famous pen company, Schaefer, in, uh, in July, um, became, uh, it, it began to compete. And Reynolds, the original company, introduced a new model and kept the price at twelve fifty. Okay, the others were pricing a little bit higher than that, but cut its cost to sixty cents. Okay, so you had a, 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 a fall in cost. You had a lot of competition, and then we had the ballpoint pen company of Hollywood finally broke through the ten dollar barrier, introduced a nine ninety five model. Okay, in October, so it's now one year later. Um, the original company introduced a new model at three eighty five. But now brought the cost down to 30 cents. Okay, uh, by December 1946, there were okay. That's about 14 months later after the first ballpoint pen. By December 1946, approximately 100 manufacturers were producing ballpoint pens and were selling them for as little as as two dollars and 98 cents. Okay, a few months later, Gimbel's began selling a pen and priced it for the first time under a dollar. Okay, 98. So it's 98 cents now, and um, the original company. Um, Cut, uh, introduced the model for 88 cents, and um, they reduced the cost by by mid 1948. Two years later, the cost was 10 cents per pen. The price was 39 cents. Okay, so that's another way that entrepreneurs earn profit. Okay, there's a continual pressure to lower your, improve your technology, improve your commercial utilization of technology, and to bring the cost down so that you can lower prices. Not because you like consumers, but because you want to outcompete the other manufacturers of that product, okay? Okay, let me just finish by saying a few things about, about profit, um, because there's some confusion about it. Um, well, one thing I already did say, past success never guarantees future success, because IBM was so successful in the 1960s, did not guarantee that IBM would be outcompeted uh, by a combination of Intel, Apple, um, um, uh, Microsoft, and so on. Okay. Um, same thing is true of the of the American car companies. Okay, who had the American market locked up in the 50s and 60s. Okay. All right. So that that I think I've I've covered um, enough. Uh, but now to turn to profits. One thing to keep in mind is that profit is not a return to a factor of production. Wages is uh, are a return to labor. Rent is a return to capital, goods, and land. Okay. Um, but what about profit? Is it, some textbooks will say profit is a return to entrepreneurship. Okay? Well, that's not really true because entrepreneurship is not a physical factor of production like labor, land, or capital goods. Keep in mind that wages and rents can never be negative, but profits can be negative. Okay? How can a factor of production earn a negative return? It doesn't make sense. Why should they work for it? No. Profit is a return to a decision, to an intellectual decision. It's a decision about how to use resources. If that decision about how to use resources is incorrect, if it uses resources to produce lower valued goods, there's a loss. If it uses resources to produce goods that are valued more highly by consumers, there's a profit. So profit is not a return to a factor. It's a return to an uh, intellectual decision. Also, profit doesn't result from restricting supply. Okay. The way you earn profit is by introducing new products uh, or by lowering the cost of old products. You don't earn profit by, re by, by producing less. Um, if you try to do that, if you try to produce less and, 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 and raise your prices that way, and you can do that temporarily, what's going to happen? Very quickly, if there's free entry, other entrepreneurs will come in and will begin to under, undersell you and um, take away your business. Okay. Um, 
another, uh, uh, well, actually, sort of implication of that is that sometimes in the, in the 70s and 80s, oil companies were, were criticized because they weren't producing more oil. This is when the price of oil was very high. They were investing in coal mines and in, in, in hotels. Okay. Now, weren't they restricting the supply of oil and keeping the price high? Well, in fact, remember, an entrepreneur is always going to invest resources where the prices are highest. Where the, rather the, 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 the profits are highest. And, and profits happen to be high in, in tourism at that time and so on. But to go beyond that, the people who thought that the oil companies should have invested more in oil exploration instead of hotel chains are completely free to raise capital and to invest in those areas. Okay? And even if they don't invest in those areas, why, why don't other entrepreneurs who see that there's a, a great demand for oil increase the output of oil? So as long as, again, there's no barrier to entry set up by government, there is no cause for saying that, well, someone is actually um, a restricting, earning profits by restricting supply. Okay. Now, finally, I want to point out that profits are never normal. There's no such thing as a normal rate of, of profit. Okay. Now, the reason why we say that is because profits arise from a maladjustment. When there's huge profits in, in, in initially in the production, let's say, of hand calculators, that meant that there were resources that could have been used to produce goods worth 350 that were producing goods worth $200. The original producer of hand calculators began to correct that maladjustment. So profits arise from a maladjustment of production. Only later on, when other companies come in and produce more, and profit disappears, can we say that the economy is adjusted. So profits arise from maladjustments. But they also indicate that the maladjustment is being corrected. Okay. Now, having said that, what about the criticism of, of, of um, entrepreneurs who are earning high profits, who are earning supposedly excess profits? Okay. And uh, one, one example you can give here is, or I like to give, is um, one that Mises gives. I, I give it a little bit more uh, content. Let's say you have a number of, of, of doctors around an isolated area, okay, a number of physicians, and there's an outbreak of, of, of an epidemic in this area. Let's say it's an area like Appalachia. People are poor and they don't seek medical attention, medical attention very frequently. They use home remedies and so on. But now this epidemic begins to, to spread. And um, so some people come to different, different uh, physicians, and one of them, B, says, wait, wait this is an epidemic. So he rushes in and sets up a clinic here right in the middle of the area. And people start lining up and he's earning huge profits. Now, people will blame that person for, for, for price gouging, for taking advantage of the great demand and people's needs for medical attention. But of course, is it B's fault? Or is it A, C, and D who haven't also, or who haven't had the insight, the entrepreneurial insight, about how conditions are going to develop in the next six months, let's say the epidemic is going to spread and there's going to be a lot of demand for medical attention, had they all rushed in, what would have happened to prices? Gone down. Okay. Now, you can't blame them either. People are as they are. They may not be as good entrepreneurs. Okay. But what, what Von Mises stresses is you don't blame the guy who earns the high profits because he's the first one that's beginning to do what? There's a maladjustment between medical service, supply and demand for medical services. He's beginning to correct that maladjustment. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll end there. Thank you.